Hey, good afternoon, everybody. I am Jonathan Metha Stein, the Executive Director of California Common Cause. Um, I'm coming to you live from my home office slash guest bedroom uh, for another episode of Lunch with California Common Cause. Thank you for joining us. First and foremost, I want to introduce you to my new plants. Um, I had no idea how calming plants could be um, prior to quarantine, so we're all finding new coping mechanisms, I guess. Um, uh, they are a real delight. Uh, second, I want to thank you for joining us here on Facebook Live because we've been streaming over on YouTube for the last several weeks. Um, I just want to share, if you've missed those shows, I want to share some topics we've covered while we were streaming this weekly show on our YouTube channel. Um, in several shows, we talked about reforms coming for the November 2020 election to make voting safe and accessible amid the COVID pandemic. Um, in the episode with Dr. Mindy Romero, we talked about research and data on how people want to vote in November including the surprising fact that 30% of Californians say they want to vote in person or need to vote in person, despite the presence of the virus. Uh, we did a whole episode about the voting rights of people with disabilities with our friends at Disability Rights California. We did a whole episode about Latino voters and Latino civic engagement with Rosalind Gold from Naleo. Uh, and we did a few episodes in which I flew solo, uh, giving updates on what had happened in the week prior in the democracy space in California. To find those episodes, you can visit um, youtube.com slash user slash CA Common Cause TV, and we'll post uh, that link in the comments here on Facebook. Alternatively, you can just go to YouTube and you can search for Common Cause TV. And you should be able to find um, our page, our channel, and you'll see a playlist for Lunch with California Common Cause. One of the reoccurring themes to this point um, in the show is that at California Common Cause, we're trying to build a democracy that includes everyone. In the episode with Rosalind Gold from Naleo, the National Association of Latino Elected and Appointed Officials, um, I started the show by talking about what it actually means to build a democracy that includes everyone. I said that in California, we've adopted most major policy items on the voting rights wish list. Automatic voter registration, same day voter registration, pre-registration of 16 and 17 year olds, vote centers, and so on. And yet, California's voter turnout rate is in the lower half of the nation. And as I've said time and again, California has really deep voter participation disparities by race and by age. We've made a huge amount of progress in lowering barriers to voter registration and to voting, and yet we have so much more work left to do. Um, and I would argue that lowering barriers, in which in California we've done as much as anyone in the state, is a necessary but maybe not sufficient step in creating an engaged electorate. There are few people better suited to talk about an engaged California electorate than Astrid Ochoa, our guest today. Um, she runs a space uh, called the Future California Elections that was a home to all of the major voting rights organizations across California in the last decade, and really the epicenter of a lot of the policy reforms I just mentioned. We're gonna talk about all of that today. Before we get to Astrid though, I wanna just give a few updates. First, um, we've talked in the past about how California is intending to send a vote by mail ballot to every single California registered voter before the November election in an attempt to make sure that every single voter has a safe option for voting at home if they want that. Um, we've also mentioned that there was a number of Republican lawsuits against uh, that decision by the state of California in an attempt to stop people from voting by mail. Um, now, specifically, uh, the, the lawsuits were against the governor's executive order, which mandated these vote by mail ballots for every voter. And the lawsuits argued um, a couple things. One, they argued that the legislature didn't, sorry, that the governor did not have the authority to um, make that decision. And that decision power, decision making power rests in the hands of the legislature alone. And then also a, a handful of, I think, very silly arguments claiming that vote by mail is so totally rife with fraud that using vote by mail um, dilutes the vote or undermines the right to vote for those who cast an honest ballot. Um, that wasn't based in any fact, it wasn't based in any data or research. It was basically the same rhetoric that we hear from Donald Trump's Twitter feed. Um, when the legislature uh, passed a bill mandating that a vote by mail ballot be sent to every registered voter, um, i.e. codify the governor's executive order, the first set of arguments being made in those lawsuits were moot. And um, plaintiffs in those cases, the California Republican Party, the National Republican Party, and so on, had to make a decision as to whether they wanted to continue the case given that their strongest arguments were moot. I'm happy to report that last week they dropped all lawsuits. 
Um, and uh, as of Thursday of last week, those lawsuits are have been dismissed. And um, Californians will receive, every registered active voter in California will receive a vote by mail ballot a month before election day in, um, in October of 2020. We think that's a huge win. California is the only state in the nation that has responded to COVID by making a decision to send every registered voter a vote by mail ballot. Not a vote by mail ballot application, but an actual vote by mail ballot. It's streamlining access for voters in California. The second update I want to give you is on redistricting. Um, the California Redistricting uh, Commission is California's independent citizen-run redistricting commission that has the power to draw lines for our congressional delegation, our state senate, and our state assembly. There is an extensive application process at the very early phases. There was 20,000 applicants for this next Citizens Redistricting Commission. Um, Latino representation was a huge issue throughout the process, with uh, only about 14% of the initial applications coming from Latino community members. This despite the fact that Latinos are 40% of the state and 29% of the citizen voting age population. Um, as the process moved along, the applicant review panel that was narrowing the pool of applicants brought that Latino percentage up uh, to 23%. Better, but probably not good enough. Um, and then in the final pool of 35, uh, the 35 eminently qualified finalists, um, there was 20% 20, uh, 20 more Latino. The next step is where things got tricky. Um, and out of the 35, the first eight commissioners were chosen by a random lottery, actual ping pong balls, sort of like bingo. Um, and that is to take the final decision of how to select these people out of the pool finalists, out of the hands of any potentially biased or corruptible decision maker and leave it to random chance, given that everyone in the pool at that phase is incredibly well qualified. Of the eight people randomly drawn, zero were Latino devastating and unacceptable outcome. Thankfully, um, the eight commissioners that have been selected to this point have an opportunity to select six more, or actually are required to select six more, and can use that opportunity to balance the diversity of the commission by increasing Latino representation. Now, I said they have an opportunity. They also have a legal obligation. Uh, the California state law says that they shall use the six additional commissioner selections to balance the diversity of the commission, gender and racial, gender diversity, geographic diversity, and racial and ethnic diversity. We sent, together with a coalition of allies, we sent the first eight commissioners a letter earlier this week explaining the importance of increasing Latino representation and explaining that they have a legal responsibility to make their six selections carefully and to build a commission that ultimately looks like the state of California. So more to come on that. Um, the final commission, all 14 members, has to be seated by one month from today, August 15th. Okay, so those are a couple updates. Um, I wanna move on to our guest now. Astrid Ochoa is the Executive Director of the Future of California Elections, a collaboration between voting rights and civic engagement advocates, civil rights organization, government reform groups, and county elections officials. In the 2010 redistricting cycle, Astrid worked at Naleo Education Fund, Educational Fund, hi Astrid, um, leading the organization's redistricting uh, community engagement strategy. Astrid has spent over a decade implementing statewide reforms that expand access to democracy and leading cross-sector partnerships. She is also co-chair for the State Language Accessibility Advisory Committee. She advises the Office of Secretary of State Alex Padilla on how to ensure language does not pose a barrier to the millions of Californians who speak, speak a language other than English at home. Astrid, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for the invitation. Yeah, of course. Um, so Astrid, we have known each other for years and years and years. Uh, and the future of California elections was established almost a decade ago. Uh, and since that time, it has been dedicated to two goals, um, modernizing elections and expanding participation in California. Um, in particular, folks has always been a place where advocates um, and elections officials could find common ground and work towards solutions together. Um, I've been part of FOS through three different stops in my career at the ACLU, at um, Asian Americans Advancing Justice Asian Law Caucus, and at Common Cause. So I love the organization and have been really grateful for the role it's played in my career. How would you describe FOS and what makes it unique? Yeah, we're, we're very fortunate uh, uh, to have such a strong and committed network of partners. So Future of California Elections started in late 2011 
we were just a two year project uh, to uh, advance the shared goals of modernizing elections and expanding participation. Uh, this was a world before online voter registration, before same day registration, before the Voters' Choice Act. And um, what made it unique is that you had government election officials and reform advocates and civil rights organizations saying, we need to improve access to California elections. We need to make uh, California election administration smoother, more efficient. And it was based on those agreements that um, we developed a shared agenda. Future of California elections is a network. We are our unique nonprofit because we we do not take positions on bills. We provide a space for dialogue, for discussion, for debate. And as we all know, for good policy, you need diversity of thought so that um, you can include different perspectives. And in a state as diverse as California is, that was critical to developing election reform policies. And so Cal I think that we were unique because we created this cross-sector collaboration um, we continue to exist because our partners were committed to the vision of collaboration that is essential for any um, network to succeed is to ensure that, num that you have a collaborative group of, of members. Um, and uh, as you mentioned, some of the organizations that you were a part of, we always try to include uh, diverse representation from the California electorate. We were very narrowly focused on just election reform. So a lot of the organizations also had a foot in just uh, nitty gritty policy details. So the conversations, you know, extended from not just voter access, but how you create the election practices to achieve those voter access goals. So it's been uh, uh, interesting, uh, I guess, run so far. We look at policy from every angle, uh, from the administration and from the voter, uh, voter side as well. So I think that's what makes us unique is, our, our network of members that is diverse and also our approach to policy um, uh, implementation and development. Yeah, it, you listed a series of major policy reforms. Um, in my uh, introductory comments, I listed a series of major policy reforms. FOS was started before any of that had happened. Um, it was really a totally different space. The democracy space was completely different in California. Voting was completely different in California. FOS has really been sort of the epicenter of like a 10 year project to overhaul California elections. And, and today I think we work about as hard as anybody to um, increase access to voters. Um, there are different groups, as you mentioned in FOS, really representing diverse communities located in different regions, coming from different perspectives. What's the common thread between all of the people who participate in the FOS Collaborative? They are experts of their field. They are collaborative. I think that has been critical to the success of the network, right? Because you can be an expert, but if you're only willing to listen to yourself and to those that think like you, then you can't advance goals. And as I mentioned, um, in the state as diverse as California, you need diversity of thinking, diversity of thought. So the common thread is really the commitment of our network to work together, um, the commitment that California, um, California's electorate needs to reflect its demographics and how do we accomplish that? So I think that's been at the root of it, uh, recognizing that uh, California elections itself needed to be modernized. I mean, it's, it's in our tagline and that, that has been our mission. It's very simple. Uh, in, in the sense that, you know, the thread is that we believe that we need to modernize elections and expand participation. Um, but it isn't just a continuous thread to continue reforming. Uh, what I think is interesting about the network is that we have pivoted recently um, because of that commitment that each individual member organization and partner organization has, which is to make sure that the reforms have their intended impact. And so in the more recent years, a future of California election, we've actually looked at implementation of the, the major reforms that we've been discussing, like online voter registration, um, like the Voters' Choice Act, like same-day registration. So that's that's the thread, is, is just the deep commitment to not just passing policy, but making sure that the policy has that intended impact and um, a mutual respect for um, the cross-sector field, right? So nonprofits really taking a moment to understand and appreciate the complexity of election administration, of election officials also recognizing the challenges of the nonprofit space, right? We work to advance 
the rights of underrepresented communities, but with very, very small budgets. Uh, and most nonprofits are very overextended. So when we come together through Future of California elections, we've been able to accelerate some of these policies. I appreciate that you put us at the epicenter. Our members are experts in their own rights. And what we've created is just a space to coordinate, to collaborate, and to accelerate um, yeah. shared goals. Yeah, yeah. What, what, what do you think is added to the collaborative by having elections officials present? There are lots of spaces where advocates form alliances, coalitions, et cetera. We work in those spaces every day at California Common Cause. Um, the only collaborative we work in that has representation from county elections officials is the future of California elections. Um, what do you think is added to our work by having elections officials in the mix? Yeah, I, I think um, so, so much. I, I, it's improved our policy discussions. Uh, sometimes a, a, a policy idea looks wonderful on paper, uh, but the realities of implementing that immediately um, are impossible unless there are administrative changes that need to happen to implement that policy. So having election officials at the table has really informed um, how policy can occur again, to achieve its intended impact. So they they bring their, um, their government expertise, their administrative expertise, um, and also their resources. So uh, we don't get grants from, from uh, government, but if you think about it, um, government agencies are in a position to touch every single voter. And the voter information guide goes to every single household. So if we can work together to improve these voter education uh, pieces or goals, then not only do we benefit as organizations by collaborating with the election offices, but the election offices also benefit because they have improved communications with, with their constituents. So having government at the table um, it has, has, I think, helped to improve overall connection with voters. Um, one of our starting points was really meeting voters where they were. And, and um, as we continue to advance policies, we try to ensure that the election officials are part of every discussion so that it isn't just about creating a policy that we think is right as advocates, um, as nonprofit organizations, but it's a, um, if we're charging the election officials with a new law, that they have the tools and the resources necessary to accomplish that. And so it's led to some really great uh, efforts of not just shaping policy, but also advocating for adequate funding uh, election officials are consistently underfunded. Um, it, you know, election resources are always very limited when a county is competing with so many goals. Um, and that's in a normal circumstance. You know, flash forward to the pandemic, we're looking at some really big challenges. And so that's why those partnerships are essential. And working with government um, really helps, I think, achieve the mission of a lot of nonprofits, which is to create the best services for your constituents. And both government and nonprofits have the same goals. So yeah. Yeah, I, I will say it, it has been, we have pushed elections officials sometimes. We have, um, um, in my past roles, threatened to sue them sometimes. Um, and yet, having elections officials who are um, willing partners has made so much of the work more effective, right? If you're drafting a bill, for example, you can run it by elections officials um, and get feedback who are you know part of the, you either part of the future of California elections or you've met through some previous you know iteration work because um, leading elections officials might have been active in FOS in 2013 and 2014 and they're gone now but those relationships are established exactly. and so you can talk to them and, and they'll say oh you know what the smaller counties are really going to be upset by this idea because they struggle with resources and ways X, Y, and Z. This will be very hard for them in some respects. Your medium-sized counties, they're going to have this reaction. Your largest counties, they're going to have this third reaction. It's just much easier to understand the um, challenges that new policy thinking presents in implementation mm -hmm. for different counties in different regions with different politics, with different resources, and so on, because you have implementers at your fingertips that you can speak with. Absolutely. And if I can add, I, you know, it, it's um, it's kind of just having a mutual respect of each other's fields, right? We, we can't assume as advocates that we know everything about election administration. And so it's great to go right to the experts that face these challenges. I mean, and before I sell the FOS model or, you know, future California, future California elections model as a kumbaya organization, you know, we have our disagreements. It isn't about agreeing on everything. It's about 
um, having that mutual respect for each other's expertise and the willingness to learn, to listen, and to take that new information to inform your own strategies and policies. Yeah, yeah. Um, I uh, I want to just talk about how things have evolved over time, right? So mm -hmm. um, early in FOS, uh, none of the reforms, some of the reforms we now take for granted, like online voter registration, right, yeah. didn't exist. Um, California has had online voter registration for years and years and years it, to the point where and online registration, by the way, in 10 languages, accessible to people with disabilities, to the point where um, if uh, another state, you hear about another state that doesn't have online voter registration at this point in California, we're like, what are you, what, are you from another century? Come on, get with the program. But in reality, right, when folks started, it wasn't, it didn't exist in California either. Can you talk about some of the major goals of FOS in the early period? In this 10-year period in which we've really overhauled California elections, what were some of the first big major projects? Yeah, they, they were actually very simple and very boring in a sense, right? Uh, administration isn't something that a lot of uh, organizations jump to. But the, the, one of the big goals was online voter registration. Many of the partners had already been working on, it and on advancing bill language for that, uh, but it hadn't moved. And so when we came together as a network to share ideas, to, to understand how it benefited voters and administration um, of elections, we were able to accelerate that policy. And, and by we, I should say the members were, Future of California Elections doesn't take position on bills, as I mentioned previously, um, but our members are large uh, organizations and they have uh, you know, presence in Sacramento and they were able to collaborate with election officials to explain how these policies benefit California. And so our early work was around online voter registration, we had to win. And then the other kind of forgotten piece of our early work was plain language. So how do you make um, these government resources like the voter information guides that go to every single household in a way that voters can understand. I think we've all been confronted with legalese and there's so many dollars that are spent on creating these uh, voter information resources. So that was one of our goals is how do we bring plain language? Our partners um, at the time consulted with what is now known as a center for civic design and they have uh, helped us in developing the Voter Bill of Rights and creating a, a very useful tool that was launched by the League of Women Voters about how to improve voter information guides. So it, it's, it's all been um, really early on. These were early wins where we realized that if we come together, we can uh, accomplish greater things. The, you know, the fact that we worked with the Secretary of State's office to improve that Voter Bill of Rights, and now it's on the website, it's printed in that voter information guide. Like these are big wins that really help empower voters by giving them the information that they need to participate in elections. So having these small little early wins helped build our success so that we can take on more complex issues. You know, voter registration has always been at the core. Um, and I believe when we started voter registration was about 70% of the electorate. And most recently we're hitting 80%. So that's you know, 10 percentage points in 10 years. So we don't take credit for all of that, but we've definitely created reforms that support uh, making voter registration easier. So I think those were kind of our big ones that we've been able to see continuously through the run of, of the organization. Yeah. Um, you know, there are other fields in, other policy fields in California um, where uh, I have colleagues and friends who, who work in them, I'm sure you do too, and the, the field has really difficult or tricky politics. It, there's, there's, you're always dealing with interorganizational dynamics and so on. We have some of that in the voting rights and democracy space, but I think a lot less than other fields. And I think it's indisputable that FOS in many ways has led to a more coordinated voting rights sector in California, um, which has enabled us to work in a more strategic way and sometimes a, a unified way, despite operating in a state of 40 million people. Um, so a great example of the sort of infrastructure that FOS provided or provides, um, current tense, um, is around the Voter's Choice Act, uh, which rolled out in a way that was county by county. Counties could opt in or not opt in. And so we, in recent years, um, we've begun to see reforms that are not statewide, but are instead at the county level, adopted at the county level. And so we're beginning to see divergence between how elections are administered 
in one county versus it's a neighboring county. Can you tell us a little bit about how the VCA, the Voters' Choice Act, was rolled out um, and how FOS created a space for advocates to coordinate across counties? Yeah, so our, our uh, work with the Voters' Choice Act actually started um, when the policies first developed. I, I got to take a, a visit to Colorado when it was rolling out its vote, vote center model. And there was a lot of discussions about the potential of how creating a vote center where every voter could vote, regardless if it was you know, near their place of residence, um, really helped to improve that voter experience. And you know, we came back, the conversations were happening in California. And so we started talking with our network of members. And like I said, these organizations include um, really uh, statewide and national experts um, on, on these discussions. So they, they wanted to have these conversations, uh, but the organizations were still exploring their positioning. So Future California Elections created a framework document that would include essentially um, a, a menu of what modern elections would look like uh, for California. And the Secretary of State then developed a committee, uh, very similar to FOSIN, that it brought together advocates and election officials to really debate uh, about what the bill language would include. And we had the Voters' Choice Act emerge from that. Um, this was in 20, it was passed in 2016. So that's we're talking right. a, few, a, you know, a few years back. Do you want to, before you continue, do you want to just say one word about, and by one word, I mean, a couple sentences about what the Voters' Choice Act does, just so that people are clear. Yeah, so the Voters' Choice Act, the conversation started probably in 2015. Yeah. Um, and there was already um, other states, like I said, Colorado was really the leading state, which um, the, the idea was how do we meet voters where they are? You know, given um, how we are changing the way we live, we no longer live uh, close to, live and work close to our home, right? So many, Commuting is, is a, a reality for many of us. And so the Voters' Choice Act essentially um, took away the need to vote at a neighborhood polling place. And instead you could vote by your place of work or where your kid's school is. Um, and so it created um, greater opportunity and greater voting options. Um, and tied to the Voters' Choice Act is that every voter receive a vote by mail ballot, even if they do not re request it. And that takes away a barrier that happens often when election day comes around and you realize your schedule is so booked and you can't make it or that you're not gonna make it home in time to vote um, or you're ill and you can't make it to a polling place. So, so that's what the Voters' Choice Act did. It created voting options for all voters. Um, and in the bill passed and five counties uh, implemented it. It was a slow rollout. These pioneer counties um, really embraced it. Uh, in 2018, right? 2018, yeah. Uh, yes, 2018. Sorry, I'm thinking 2017, it was our planning, but yes, in 2018. And, um, and so that's what the bill did. Uh, Future of California Elections launched the Voters' Choice California project. And our, our goal was to empower uh, the election officials and local communities to bring our cross-sector model at the local level um, one of the really exciting features of the Voters' Choice Act is that it invites the voter to be part of shaping their election administration plan. Um, and that is something that is so different. Like, how do you think about where voting locations are? How do you think about um, what uh, workshops for voter education should look like for limited English proficient voters or voter disabilities? So there was a lot of aspects of the bill that required and uh, that, no, that required, I was saying encouraged, but really it's a requirement in the law that it requires election officials to work with local partners. And this was exactly the model of future of California elections. So we stepped into this space, um, uh, again, thanks to the leadership of our members. And I, I have to say them because I keep on saying we, and when I say we, it really is, you know, the ACLU, Asian Americans Advancing Justice, um, ALC and Los Angeles, the California Voter Foundation, CalPERG, uh, Disability Rights California, MALDA, the League of Women Voters of California, Naleo Educational Fund, Rock the Vote, Verify Voting. So these were our founding members. They serve as our steering committee and yeah. California Common Cause. And California Common Cause, yes. Which was yeah. always at the forefront of policy debate discussion and, and doing this work. And I, I take the moment to say the name specifically because these members, our, our founding members and our steering committee, um, for practical purposes, they roll up their sleeves and they work with those staff uh, to develop the strategy, 
to develop the resources, to do the outreach, um, uh, to do that legwork. So it isn't a network that sits back and just benefits from sharing uh, information. It's a network that is incredibly active, incredibly committed to, to making California elections accessible. And I did not mention one of our most critical partners, which we've been talking about this entire time, which is the California Association of Clerks and Election Officials, CACO. And without their commitment to review, to edit, to think strategy, um, folks wouldn't have that success. So when we launched the Voters' Choice California model, uh, it was thinking about how do we bring folks local? Um, and we activated a lot of local networks. We, um, again, we being the, the members themselves, reached out to election officials in the Voters' Choice Act counties to develop relationships. We identified local nonprofit partners. And since then, we've grown um, much bigger in terms of the network of organizations that are committed to this vision of cross-sector collaboration. And we can include many, many more members now. Um, but I can go on and on because this is work I'm so passionate about. So cut me off if you need yeah, to. Yeah, so what I think what's important is that, is that the Voters' Choice Act is not mandated across the state. It, counties can adopt the Voters' Choice Act if they want. And it That's offers right. that location flexibility where you can vote anywhere in the county. It offers that vote by mail ballot for every single voter. It offers early voting. Voting sites are available for four days or 11 days. Um, so there's plenty, there's early voting at every voting site. Um, but counties don't have to opt in. And a lot of counties uh, aren't and going into the future won't. Um, and so what that means is that we were, you know, organizations on the ground in Madera County. Yeah. We're tracking Madera County's implementation of the Voters' Choice Act. Organizations and, and voters and advocates on the ground in Napa County, in Orange County, you know, in San Mateo County, and through the future of California election, elections created a space in which people from all these different counties could come into one space and say, "Hey, listen, we're having this problem in Santa Clara County. Like, how did you overcome that? Oh, well, in Sacramento County, here's what we did to address that problem. Or here's a great idea coming out of Orange County. Like, you all should try to get that implemented." in Fresno County, in Napa County, in San Mateo County, in whatever, right? Um, and so it was a space in which um, all of these different, different, disparate experiences from around this massive state of ours um, mm -hmm. could be shared in one space. And you could talk about best practices and you could, you could share complaints and you could share mm -hmm. ideas. Uh, and, and it was, it, it, it was it really useful. To, it goes back to, I think some of uh, my root values is, you know, we, we can't do it all. It's a huge state, like you said, 40 million people. And um, this was the first time that the Voters' Choice Act was being implemented in California with all the language requirements, with community organizations. And so the best approach was to, to learn together. And that's what we did. So we established the Voters' Choice California um, Steering Committee, which kept kind of, a, they were the activators of all of the counties that were implementing the Voters' Choice Act in 2018. And Let me stop you. Let me stop you just so that everyone understands because this terminology can be confusing. The Voters' Choice Act is the law that enables this new election system. Voters' Choice California is a sort of implementation hub in which different groups working on Voters' Choice Act implementation in different counties can come together to share their experiences. Yeah, thank you. Yes. It's Sorry, I don't know if that was necessary, but I would, the names are so similar that I thought that it would be helpful. I know, we did that on purpose. Sorry. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, we wanted to make sure that the project was very tied to our intention. And so we only focus on Voters' Choice Act counties. Um, but we also had a coalition, as Jonathan was saying, that we were sharing and learning together, just being vulnerable, really, right? Election administrators, government officials, they're expected to have all the answers. But that's a very false expectation when it's the very first time that this is happening. So people were trying their best, trying to figure it out. and. Um, and research from the now Center for Inclusive Democracy, formerly CCP, showed that there were some um, positive uh, benefits to the Voters' Choice Act in terms of voter participation rates. So that was exciting. We're continuing the project now uh, as well. There are 15 counties implementing the Voters' Choice Act for 2020. Um, we have not been able to activate the local hubs just because they're it's very resource intensive to do that and we were not able to secure the funding. I'm sure many nonprofits can relate to those realities, uh, but we have activated local networks for Los Angeles and for Orange County um, and those were prioritized just because of the size of the voting population um, that those two counties represent in terms of the electorate. So 
Uh, we, we have continued our voters choice steering committee. So we're monitoring statewide implementation in all 15 counties, again, but only local hubs in, in two for, for this cycle. Um, and all of that information is available on our voterschoice.org website um, if people wanted to get plugged into that work. So uh, let me just, for anyone who's joining us or joined us in the last few minutes, I'm Jonathan Methestein. That's Astrid Ochoa. Um, I'm the executive director of California Common Cause. She's the executive director of the Future of California Elections. Um, and we're talking about um, this essentially 10-year uh, collaboration between um, civil rights advocates, government reform groups, and elections officials um, that has really helped overhaul California's elections for the better. Um, if you have any questions, please do input them in the chat section um, here uh, on our Facebook Live, and we'll get to them um, when Astrid and I are, are uh, through, you know, talking through some issues. Um, uh, thanks again for joining us and um, for tra transitioning uh, from YouTube over to Facebook with us this week. We'll be here going forward. Um, Astrid, do you want to share with us what FOS is working on now? Yes. So. Um... We have, I think, one of our, our biggest challenges before us. Um, our world is hurting from a pandemic, um, and that affects every aspect of our life, including elections and how we're going to vote. Uh, the unpredictability of the pandemic, as we have seen California now starting to shut down again, um, uh, has created a very challenging space to navigate election administration, voter outreach, uh, traditional methods of reaching voters um, can't happen if you can't connect in person uh, for the hardest to reach populations. And so Future of California Elections found itself um, with an opportunity to serve in this moment, given our network and the nature of what we've been doing, uh, which is really ensuring that voters understand how to vote. We've shifted our programming to focus on how to ensure that voters have the information they need to vote this pandemic. So building on our work from the Voters' Choice Act um, and informing voters of a transitioning to a new voting model. Uh, similarly, we're taking those lessons learned and those practices to support voter education, public education on, um, on voting through a pandemic. And what's exciting is, as you um, started this dialogue is that California is sending every voter a vote by mail ballot but that doesn't mean that voters have to vote by mail. They can still uh, go to in-person voting locations. Additionally, counties across the state are offering early voting opportunities. Um, and elections can only be successful if voters understand how to vote. And given, again, the unpredictability of the pandemic, I think it's, it'll be more important now than ever for voters to, to know that they have options because life changes uh, on a week by week basis. So that is our goal, that's our focus. We are expanding our network to include, you know, any nonprofit that wants this information. Um, uh, right now we are in a partnership uh, with the Center for Inclusive Democracy to do research on um, voting messaging and uh, voter intention for voting through a pandemic. And I know Jonathan, you all are doing research that is very complementary to that. So. We want to make sure that the resources that we're putting out there are going to uh, connect with voters. That's the always been the critical piece of what we do is to ensure uh, resources and information is plain language and that we're providing the right contacts. So um, because we are a network, we don't do direct voter outreach, but we do know that the best way to inform voters of, of the information is to have a coordinated message. Uh, voter confusion is real when you're getting information from all these different sources. And so FOS is going to continue uh, bringing together election stakeholders to make sure that voters know where and how to vote for this November. Right. And, and the study that you're working on with the Center for Inclusive Democracy, very complementary to the study that we're working on um, with the Center for Social Innovation at UC Riverside. Your study is a, a survey where uh, you know, you're reaching a huge number of people. Our study, by contrast, is focus groups. So we did we did seven focus groups in six languages. So we're 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 basically examining the same set of questions, I think, but with different methodologies. And uh, we'll share the results of both on our Facebook page, on our Twitter. So follow us on social media um, if you want to see, you know, what we what we're finding about how voters want to vote in November amid a pandemic. 
and what messages work to explain the changes coming in the November 2020 election. Um, okay, so last question for you um, before, Astrid, before we turn to um, questions from our, uh, our viewers. Uh, and again, folks, um, if you're viewing at home or on your phone, please do put a question in the comment section um, and our staff working behind the scenes will make sure that I see that. Um, so Astrid, I saw a national ranking of states by how easy or how hard they make it to vote. And California was ranked third easiest. Um, and I think that in large part, that's because of the work done by um, voting rights advocates uh, over the last decade, many of them working through and in the future California elections uh, network. Um, we're only behind two states, both of which provide a vote by mail ballot to every voter. And that's something we're transitioning to certainly in the November 2020 election as a response to the pandemic, but also through the Voters' Choice Act, counties can opt into a model in which they send every single um, uh, voter a vote by mail ballot. So we're getting essentially to the top of the list, I think. And yet, California voter turnout is in the lower half of the nation. And um, we have, uh, you know, Latino and Asian American communities that vote at dramatically lower rates than other racial and ethnic groups. We have young voters that vote at much lower rates than other age groups. What do you see as the future of the field? Like, where do California elections go from here? So I, I try not to get discouraged by the numbers because uh, it is true when you look at them after all the work we've been doing, uh, there have been improvements and we would definitely want to see um, greater participation um, uh, and to reduce those gaps. But I try to remember that, you know, next month we're celebrating 100 years of the women's right to vote, um, but it has only been 55 years since the Voting Rights Act. And that was the first uh, law that really addressed uh, racial discrimination um, to reach out to language minority communities, to reach out to black voters. Um, and we're only gonna be hitting 30 years of the American with Disabilities Act. So it hasn't been that long that um, we have actively been pursuing to make sure that every voter truly has the right to vote. So I, I try to keep that in mind. Um, not to look at the numbers as just a, a, a moment, oh my gosh, we're failing, but look at the fact that the history of access is actually quite short. Totally. Uh, so for me, the future of voting is, is, is that, continue implementing the laws that are intended to grant rights to voters um, and to consider the diversity of California. I mean, yep. 40 million people, that's, that's huge. You know, yeah. that's bigger than many countries, California alone. <laughs> so, so I think it's just respecting the diversity, um, not expecting things to happen quickly. Um, I think when we try to rush to a policy solution, uh, sometimes it has unintended consequences. Uh, so for me, the future of voting, the future of elections is to continue going the path that we're going in the sense of creating spaces uh, with diversity of thinking when you're implementing policy. So one of the um, awful tendencies that I'm glad we've gotten away from here in California is to start building policies and then add on access at the end, right? So you build a policy and then you build it to meet the needs of voters with disabilities or you build it then to meet the needs of language access. So for me, the future of voting, the future of policy development is to include diversity of thought when you're starting that development of a policy of an issue. Um, and that is how we're going to get to more successful outcomes. Um, and then once you pass a policy, don't just leave it behind, but do the follow through, do the work, roll up your sleeves to make sure that they have that intended impact. So it isn't just about having a vision, it's about implementing that as well. And so that's, that's the path that we're heading on. That's the commitment of our network is to continue uh, ensuring that policies have those, those intended impacts. I think that we have a lot of work to do. And for me, um, the future of California elections isn't always the next innovative greatest thing. It's about how do we make sure that the future of California election looks like a diverse electorate. Yeah, yeah, I completely, totally agree. Um, and you know, to your point about how some of access to voting and uh, like true meaningful voting rights is more recent than people expect, right? Um, this is something I, I talked a lot about when I was at Asian Americans Advancing Justice, Asian Law Caucus, but um, the Chinese immigrants were given the right to vote at the repeal of the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1943. 
Filipino immigrants and Indian immigrants were given the right to vote, I believe in 1945. I, these numbers could be plus or minus a year. And then Congress gave up the process of giving voting rights to Asian immigrants in this piecemeal fashion in 1952 and granted all Asian immigrants citizenship rights and the right to vote in 1952. My mom is an Asian immigrant. She's she was born in 1952. Literally the right to vote for some of the people in our communities is exactly one lifetime old and not any older, right? Um, it is not this ancient right that everybody knows and is familiar with. Um, and particularly, as you mentioned in the state with as many um, communities and as many immigrants as we have, um, the future of California elections is constantly being made, you know? Um, so anyway, thank you for okay, sharing your yeah. thoughts. I appreciate that. Um, I uh, will turn it now to questions from our viewers. Um, and uh, we have one question, what, is FOS uh, and what are California Common Cause doing to educate voters about the changes coming in the November 2020 election? Yeah, so uh, thank you for your question. And right now, as we mentioned, we have uh, research projects uh, to really inform the messaging. Our, our goal is going to be around public education to make sure that voters understand their options for voting. There are gonna be changes in counties um, and so it's important that voters know what those changes are and what their options are. So our um, work will be directly to develop uh, essentially a communications toolkit for nonprofits, for those doing outreach, uh, to make sure that they have the resources and the information that they need to communicate it to voters. And the reason we're taking this approach is because we know that um, no individual organization, whether government or nonprofit, has the resources to reach everyone. And so by coming together, by developing shared messaging, um, by coordinating a strategy for outreach, we're hoping that we can reach uh, as many voters as we can. And uh, research shows that it takes five times for somebody to hear a message for it to stay with them. And so if they're hearing it from uh, folks, from uh, their election official, from Common Cause, uh, you know, each of the touches is going to help build a greater understanding of how to vote for this November. And so that is where we're focusing our resources is working with our network of partners to develop plain language messaging and communications for the November election. Yeah, thank you for that. And thank you for all the incredible work that you do, um, Astrid, that you do now and you've been doing for years. Um, this, so that's all the time we have today. We're gonna wrap it up. Thank you so much, Astrid. Um, Astrid Ochoa is the Executive Director of the Future of California Elections. Um, you can follow the Future of California Elections on Twitter at futurecaelect. Do I have that right, Astrid? Mm -hmm. Yeah, awesome. you say like on Twitter. Um, you can follow us on Twitter at Common Cause CA. You can follow me on Twitter at um, underscore Jonathan Stein. Astrid, do you want to shout out your personal Twitter handle? Um, I don't remember. I'll probably give the wrong one. But you can follow at Future CA Elect. And um, I just want to say thank you, Jonathan, for your leadership. I, I know it's only been two months. That's incredible. Um, but you know, Common Cause is a great organization. Um, thank you for the invitation to highlight our work. And if folks want to get connected and believe in a collaborative model, look us up. Yeah, I, I am so happy to have been part of um, those for, for so many years. Um, uh, it was, this was a great conversation and thank you for sharing about um, the, the network. Um, so folks, if you're listening at home, remember to join us um, every week, uh, Wednesdays at noon for lunch with California Common Cause. We have a guest on every other week um, and so next week, uh, it'll be just me giving us an update on the democracy space in California. Two weeks from now, we'll have Dan Newman, who is the executive director of MapLight, an organization that shines light on uh, money in politics, who just came out with a graphic novel about the fight for a better democracy in America. It's fantastic. I have a copy on my coffee table. I should have brought it in, but I didn't. Um, and so we'll be talking about that in two weeks. If you want to catch up on our um, previous episodes from previous weeks, you'll find them on our YouTube channel. Go to YouTube and search Common Cause TV. As always, we appreciate you and your support of uh, Common Cause. Thanks for being with us in the fight for a better democracy. See you next week.